is great. Um, uh, so we're in this new series. We ended Revelation, and, and the, the thought was, okay, what do we, now what? How do you follow up with, you know, with, with you end, you end kind of this series, this really intense series in Revelation and going, all right, it's clear there's, it's clear there's two groups. There's those who are against the lamb and those who are for the lamb. And, and I want to be for the lamb. I want to lean more into my faith. I want to I follow Jesus more, not less. What does that look like? And so we said, man, we need to do a, this, this thing, discipleship, that the church talks about, this word that, is, that, that the church uses, but it can often be confusing. And like, what does that mean? Let's lean into that because really, we're, we, should be, we should be desiring to become more, better, closer, more devout disciples in light of what we read in Revelation, in light of the fact that the lamb wins and we're on the winning side. All right, I wanna be a better disciple, a closer disciple, not, you know, not, uh, I don't wanna lean, I wanna lean into Jesus, not out of, not away from Jesus. So we're doing this series called um, Deconstructing Discipleship because Let's be honest, discipleship is a word, it's a very churchy word, like no one else uses discipleship outside of the church. But what does it mean? And we talk about discipleship and churches have their, they'll have their mission statements as like, we're a church that, uh, we're a church of disciples that makes disciples. And you're like, yeah, go get them. What do you guys do? I don't know. How do you make disciples? We have Bible studies. But then what do you do? We have more Bible studies. And you're like, well, right, but, but what, is that what it means to be a disciple? And when Jesus says, go and make disciples, like we just heard, is that what he means? Like, hey, just start, just get in more Bible studies and just acquire more knowledge about the Bible, more information about God. And that's what it means to be a disciple. And, and we could ask, this church, we could ask, we could pull the churches in Ben and say like, hey, what does discipleship mean? And, and we'll get all kinds of answers. And, and some of them will, honestly, a, a lot will probably say, I don't really know. I know we're supposed to do it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means when like, how do you know you are a disciple? Let me go ask my pastor. And you're like, ah, because it's such a, it's such a kind of a, a, a word, we, a thing we know we should be doing, but it's so kind of convoluted and like, what? So this series is to, is to help us understand what it means. What it means, how do I know I'm a disciple? What does it look like to be a disciple? And, and how should I be living in light of that? So we're, we're doing this, um, I, what I think is a helpful way to understand this is uh, an acronym. And um, the acronym is this, it's MARKS. So here are the marks of a disciple, the evidence or the, the, the things that identify a disciple. And this wasn't created by me. This, right, there's nothing new under the sun. This was uh, a, a, another pastor um, named Robbie Gallaty kind of came up with this and it really helped me and, and even our team as we lean into discipleship these last couple of years and think about what does it mean to be a disciple, to make disciples? How do we do that? How do you scale that on a large scale with, at a larger church? Like where there's a lot of people, how do we, how do we make disciples who make disciples? And and, um, and this is the, the thing that, you know, this guy came up with. It, um, it's Mark's M-A-R, and then he cheats. He uses a C instead of a K. So, you know, spelling's not the strong suit. M-A, uh, M-A-R-C-S. And this, so hence we're in this now, this series, and we're going through, all right. By the time we're done, we'll have these five things, these five traits we say, this is what a disciple does. This is who a disciple is, these five things. So we're starting today with the M. The M stands for missional. Here's what it means. You're on a mission. We have a mission. We've been given a mission. And the mission isn't that you have a nice life. The mission is not that you have the happiest possible life you can. The mission isn't that everyone else does what they can to make your life easier. The mission isn't that everyone understands you're right and they're not. You don't have a mission. You've not been given a mission to make your life better as though that's the goal of life. I know that's the meaning of life for many people is to be as happy as possible. Our mission is not, let's just make our, let's do everything we can to make ourselves happy. Now, when, when the word mission comes up, when you hear the word mission, you probably think of certain things, right? What comes to mind when you think of missions? You often think of a mission trip or a missionary, someone 
who goes somewhere else, right? You, like for, for you to be on a mission, you got to get on a plane, right? Or, or, or maybe drive to another country. you got to cross a border. If it's just in town, it's just ministry. If it's overseas, it's a mission. Whoa, right? And then you're, it's like, wow, I'm, this is super ministry. And, and missions, in our mind, we think of missions as something over there, somewhere we go to, and then we come back from it, and now we're done with our mission. Or, um, uh, you know, missionaries will go for two years, and they're like, oh, I'm, I'm coming home from my mission. What if, what if the biblical idea of missions is, is not that, is, is something that's different? What if that's not the, the actual biblical accurate description of missions? What if missions and being missional is, isn't about where you are, but instead it's about who you are? What if, what if it's not about going over there, but it's, it happens anywhere? What if, what if it's not about a destination, but it's a mindset? What if we said this? Living on mission isn't an event. What if it's a lifestyle? When we think of missions, we often think of, you know, you get on a plane, and, and we are, New Hope Church is a supporter of missions. We have a mission department. We have missionaries, full-time missionaries that we support. We just sent a short-term mission trip from, you know, New Hope people, New Hopers, on a mission trip to go to Honduras. Like, we're, missions, oh, yeah, we're in. This isn't like a, no, we're, we're done with missions. Of course not. The problem isn't that, like, oh, the mission, like, whoa, we're not going to do missions. No, that's not the issue. The issue is this. We think that the only mission is when you go somewhere else. And you have failed to realize you are on a mission right now. You're, listen, you're a missionary. And, and you're a missionary whether you want to be or not. It's not because you chose. You're like, you know what? It's Sunday, September. Oh, school, new school year? I'm starting my new mission trip. <laughs> you're a missionary whether you Know it or not. And, and you're a missionary, ready? Whether you like it or not. Some of us might not actually like it. You're, what if, what if you view your life as always being a mission? Everything you do, you do as a missionary. Where you are, where you live, in your neighborhood, at your work, at your school, wherever it is, you are living a missional, a missionary kind of lifestyle. Now, we're told, we're given our mission, right? We, we just heard it read. I'm going to read it here, not in nearly as cool of a voice. But here's what the Great Commission we're given. Matthew 28, Jesus' words before he's with his disciples, he's about to leave and, uh, and ascend to heaven, and he says this. This is the mission he gives us. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven, and notice this, and on earth. This is not, hey, we're just waiting till we get to Jesus' kingdom in heaven. We saw, we read Revelation, he wins, we're just, we're just holding out and waiting for him. We're just waiting for him to come back or we go to him. Either he comes to us or we go to him. Until then, we're just holding on. We're just holding on for dear life. All authority in heaven, he says, and where you guys live. And on earth, I have all authority there too. And because I have all authority, he says, all authority in in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And because of that, here's what I want. And he can give us any mission he wants. At this point, any, listen, anything he tells us to do, that's now our marching orders. He gives us any mission statement, anything. He says, this is what you're supposed to do now. And here's what he says. Here's what he, therefore, here's what I want you to do. Ready? I want you to go make disciples. That's it. This could be anything he wanted. Go help the poor. We're supposed to help the poor, but that's not the primary mission. Go build education centers. Hey, we'll build education centers, but that's not the primary mission. Um, go, uh, uh, go, go help, go help uh, relief. Go, go be the, the primary people to provide relief during crisis. Hey, that's a great thing. That's not our primary mission. Go go. Go make as many, many ministries in the church as possible to serve everyone everywhere. No, that's not the mission. Though that, that's a good thing. Go make disciples. Now, whatever a disciple, whatever a disciple is, whatever discipleship is, it seems to be important to Jesus. 
So much so that he says, I have all authority, everything. All authority, heaven and earth. And here's what I want you to do with this authority. I want you to make disciples. I don't know what a disciple is. I guess you got to figure it out, don't you? This, this series, f- both for you and for me, this is not going to be what you want to hear. It's going to be what you need to hear. I-, I look at this series as, for myself included, even as I'm studying, going through this, like, oh, man, this is medicine. N- n- right? Anyone really enjoy medicine? You're like, man, the, the bigger the pill, the better. I just love it. Right? <laughs> The, the bitter, the cough syrup, they're like, oh, wow, they really nailed this flavor. <laughs> Nobody likes medicine, but you take it, and you're like, I, I need it. This, this series is medicine for us. This series is not what we want to hear. This isn't like scratching our itching ears. This is, I need to hear this. I need to be reminded and, and to be told, like, this, the, our mission, we have a mission, and it is serious. It is important. Here's what he says. Go for it. Go and make disciples of all nations. And here's what you do. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is why we do baptisms. This is why you baptize in the, the Trinitarian, called Trinitarian baptism, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's Sunday morning. We, every week we're like, here's what Jesus said. Now let's go do it. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Here's what he says. I have all authority and I'm behind you. I'm behind you in this. As you go carry out your mission, I have all authority in heaven and on earth, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. Till this whole thing is done, I'm with you. This is not you going off by yourself. I'm giving, I have authority, and I will be with you as you go carry out your mission. We can say this, missional living, then, is allowing God to use you whenever, wherever. I want you to remember that. If I'm, if I'm going to be serious about living, like the, living out this mission, it means I need to be allow, like allowing God to use me whenever and wherever. This is good news, bad news. Here's the good news. That God is with you as you do this. Like this is awesome. Awesome. Okay. I can, I can live as a missionary whenever and wherever. Here's the bad news. You have to be a missionary whenever wherever. This means when you're in the grocery store, you are a missionary. And you can't find that item and you're getting frustrated, right? This is me, like, every grocery trip, I'm like, I got the list of stuff. I, I don't know if this is true, by the way. This isn't in my notes, but here we go. Does, does it... I don't know how my wife does it. She's done in five minutes and has everything. I'm there for three hours. I've called her six times. And I'm like, I still don't know where this is. She's like, it's right there. Um, anyways, and, and I'm like losing my cool. All right, in that moment, I'm a missionary. I'm a pretty dumb missionary, but I am a missionary right now. When, when, you, when you're at work, when you're at work and you're doing work, and it's not, it's not like, it's not Jesus time, it's not church time, you're at work time. Guess what? You're a missionary. That's Jesus time. People, whether you know this or not, whether you like this or not, People are watching you. If they know you're a follower of Jesus, which they should. If you're a disciple, then it, it should be obvious. You should be living different. It should be clear. And, and if people know that, they are watching you. They're watching what you do well, and they're also watching for you to make a mistake. They're also watching for you to live inconsistently. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect, but just know this. Eyeballs are on you. And here's how you know that to be true, because occasionally someone will say, hey, I saw how you, you did that thing the other day. That was really cool. I saw how you responded to that person who was really upset and like, you, man, you were way more patient than I could ever be. Wow, I don't know how you did that. And then your response is not, it's because I'm awesome. <laughs> your response is, you know what? God is patient with me so I can be patient with people. Whoa, did you just preach the gospel in that moment? Because you're a missionary. And, and, and here's the thing. They also notice when you don't do so well, like, hey, I thought you went to church, but man, I heard you saying some things. Do you use those words at church? <laughs> like, is that, how you, is that really how you talk? Oh, man, you, you heard that? Whoops, sorry. Oh, you're a missionary. And they know that. And people are deciding if they want to follow Jesus. You might be the only Christian in their life. And they're deciding if they want to follow Jesus based on what you do. And they're deciding, wow, this seems to have a, a really good effect in their life. Like, man, it, it, it works for them. And while they're... They, there's something different about them. Or, or they say, if that's a Christian, I don't ever want to be one. If that's a Christian, you're the most gossipy, mean-spirited, judgmental person I know. Of all my non-Christian friends, you're the worst. And then when you invite them to church, they're going, heck no. 
a church full of those people? Full of those judgmental, mean-spirited? Like, the, I, have no, I have no desire to go there. You and I are living, we are missionaries, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. So how do we do that? Now, we're going to go through three different things of, of how you, like, what it means to be a missionary, to live missionally right where you are, not to, like, get on a plane and say, i got to fly somewhere, but to, to, to view your life and your mindset and your lifestyle as one of mission. And here's the first thing. And this first thing is going to, this is going to, this is going to mess you up. If you do this, if you really do this, this is going to mess with, with your outlook on life. This is going to mess with you politically. This is going to mess with you during this election season and how you vote because it, it changes things. I don't know if it's going to change who you vote for. I, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it, it matters in that, you know, our president matters, but it doesn't matter to me. Like, I, who you vote for is who you vote for. Go for it. Um, it you know, as long as you don't write my name in, that's fine. <laughs> Here's the first thing. Ready? This changes now how you see the world if, you do, if you're serious about this. Step one or you know, posture one of someone who is allowing God to use them whenever, wherever is this. You, you see people as God sees them. Which means you look at them with compassion and with purpose. Here's what this means, ready? People are not your enemy. Even though they're on the wrong side of the aisle, whatever that, you know, we use that term, like that means, you know, they're the other person, they're, I'm, I'm this, they're that. That is not your enemy. Though they may disagree with you politically, though they may disagree with you theologically, though they may disagree with you in identity and how they live and, and, uh, and their, their views of, of, literally, you can go down the list of every issue and be like, we are opposite on every single thing. And you know what's still the same though? You know what you have in common? You're a sinner in need of a savior and you're, you both are people that Jesus loves and die for. That person that, you know, you turn on the TV and like it's just that, you know, the, the red guy is yelling at the blue guy and then the blue guy is yelling at the red guy. And, and the, Listen, you know what's true, both of them? They both are sinners in need of a savior. They're not the enemy of each other. You, you, when you start doing this, when you start seeing people that are very different than you, that have different morality, different ethics, different ideas of life, when you, when you see them as the enemy, as someone to either judge or convert or to get their, right, their wrong thinking made right again, which, by the way, is always your own. Like, everyone's thinking is the right way, right? And like, we're all right. If that's how you view people, you, will, you, you are now stunted in your ability to live as a, as a missionary, as a, as a disciple who's living on mission. Because here's, here's what happens. And so let me, okay, let me, I don't want to get political, but we're in a pol- political season. I've been, I've been actually leaning more into politics, or not necessarily politics, but rather the, how the church should respond to politics, especially in, you know, this season that is probably, probably the most divisive political season of our lifetime, right? And you're going like, after 2020, how could it get worse? Oh, welcome 2024, right? And, and it's like craziness. What should be the church's involvement in politics? And, and you have two extremes. Either we should avoid it. Hey, it's not our thing. Let, let the world deal with their thing and we stay true to us. Or, or we should, we see ourselves as being, we should be people who are influencing politics. It should be our primary driver. It should be the way in which we bring about God's like, plan for the earth. It should be through politics and we should vote in the people. And like, that's how we fight. Or there's something somewhere in the middle where you're like, all right, it's, I don't think it's one of those, but it, it's not escapism and it's not control. So what, like, what's the pocket of the church? And this is where this comes into play. That you see people how God sees them and you have to realize that this is, there's a few things that are true. Number one, this is good news. Oh man, you're gonna, I hope you cheer for this. Last, ser- last service they clapped and you guys are a better service, right? So <laughs> one day there will be no more politics. Isn't that awesome? Like... They might have been a little louder than you, but that's fine. That's fine. They're a little more excited for no politics. One day, politics will be over, and it's not going to be like, oh, man, another election cycle. One day, it'll be done, and it's like, oh, awesome. Until then, here we are, and we're in the midst of it, and we say, all right, my view is this. I am a follower of Jesus who, who wants to see this world 
better, like the, the world for our kids, better than worse, right? And everyone agrees on this. We want the world to be better for our kids, not worse. Everyone will say that. What that looks like now is what we debate. And here's the thing. Here's, here's where you know you're, uh, you're in a world of hurt. And, and, and people may leave the church over the statement, and that's fine because that's, I think this is the most biblical posture we can have. Other churches might not be this way, but here we go. If you say, if you say, I am a Republican who is a Christian, that's a problem. If you say, I'm a Democrat who's a Christian, that's a problem. You are not a disciple. You have identified with a, with a, with a political identity and then you just added Jesus to it. Here's, the, here's what you do. If you've done that, if, if you identify yourself as like, I am a political party, or maybe you know some of you are like, I'm an independent. And you're like, okay, all right, you're better than the rest. I'm an independent. You're like, you'll never elect anyone. Okay, you're an independent. <laughs> I'm an independent who is a Christian. That is, you, you, you too, you too have failed the discipleship test. Because what you've done is you've said, I follow the lion, I follow the lamb, but the lamb comes under my elephant. The lamb comes under my donkey. I'm a donkey who also follows the lamb. I'm an elephant who follows the lamb. Instead, what you say is this, I'm a follower of Jesus, and, and I, vote, I vote my convictions. I, I, I'm not beholden to a political party, and, 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 I'm not, and I don't see people who are on the other side as the enemy. You're like, oh, wow, you voted, you voted for who? How could you do that? Uh, newsflash, they're all bad candidates. <laughs> like, 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 doesn't matter who you pick, it's not the one you want, but here we go. So, so here's the thing. If you start seeing people, instead of seeing them as the enemy, but you see them how Jesus sees them, this changes everything for you. It changes how you engage in politics. And it, you recognize that the fight is not like who gets elected. The fight is for your soul. You vote who you want to vote. I vote who I, I am convicted that, you know, all right. But that's not how I live out my faith. I'm a follower of Jesus. I, like when it's all said and done, I identify with the lamb, not, a, a, not an elephant or a Democrat or, a, or, or independent. I don't even know what that animal is. A, 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 an eye, I don't know. Look at, what, look at what, how Jesus saw people. Okay, ready? In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, here's what it says. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And here's why. Because they were, they were harassed and helpless. Like, like sheep without a shepherd. He looks at people and he doesn't see how they voted or or if they agree with him theologically or if, or if they're living their best moral life or if they're on the side of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Zealots and he's like, ah, what, what, what polit-? He looks at people and says, man, they need a shepherd. They're being harassed and, and they're helpless and they need, they need someone who can come along and, and, and say, hey, I'll take care of you. I, welcome to the fold like sheep without a shepherd, and he has compassion on them. People that you disagree with, people that work, it, it's so easy to get in fights over like politics, and it's, can, can I be honest? That's such low-hanging fruit. Like that's such, that's such bottom-tier like understanding of your faith is just to fight politically. Ah, I, who cares? Instead, what you do is you, you speak convictions, you speak, you say, this is, this is, I hold this view because I feel like this is biblical. Can I tell you this too? Both parties do not focus on being biblical. It's control. You can pick either party and be like, that's clearly not biblical. Your job is to be a, fa- a faithful disciple of Jesus who has the privilege and luxury to vote your conscience. Vote what you want. But don't, let's not pretend that somehow, that somehow being a Christian means you vote a particular, for a particular person or else. And, and and, and when Jesus sees people, he doesn't see enemies. He had compa- an intense gut level, a gut level compassion for people who were different. And so different that he got accused. He got accused of being a terrible person because he hung out with them. You know the whole like, uh, you know, uh, the bad apple spoils the bunch. Jesus is like, where's all the, ba- the, the bad apples are my people. <laughs> and, and he was like, Jesus, you're a rabbi and you, you're a friend of sinners? You, you go to like meals with them? Like, yeah, and they're way better than your meals. <laughs> like, like, Jesus, he goes, where are the sick people? That's who need the doctor, not the healthy. Where are the sick people? I want to be there. 
He sees crowds who are completely different than him and says, all right, I have compassion. And man, like they are sheep without a shepherd. And I don't, I don't need to tell you this. There are a lot of people in this world right now, us included, who feel harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd. Who have been harassed by addiction, harassed by maybe a political ideology, harassed by, by, by actual people in their life, harassed by, by employers, and they just feel like I, no one's on my side. And instead of us yelling and you know, pointing and judging, we say, hey, we've got one who is a shepherd. I was just saying, listen, I'm, all of us, without the shepherd, we're all helpless and, and harassed and sheep without a shepherd. It's, it's all because of Jesus. So we see people as God sees them. Here's the next thing, ready? You and I, you and I. So that's right away. We change our mindset towards people. They are not enemies. They are not the problem. They are people that God loves and has compassion for. Number two, be ready to share the reason for your hope. Here's what this means. Always prepared, always willing. You have to be ready to share the reason you are a follower of Jesus. Let me ask this question. And again, this is medicine you need, not necessarily what you want. Um, If someone were to ask you this question, why are you a Christian? Or why do you go to church? Or why do you believe in Jesus? Do you have an answer? What would you say? Okay, this is gonna hurt a little bit. If you don't have an answer to that question, you cannot possibly be a faithful, devoted disciple. If you don't have an answer to the question of why do you do this? If you don't know, it's, but by the way, you, there's still plenty of time for you to, to, under, to, to know why. But if you can't explain, then here's what that means. You are not ready to live out your mission. You are not ready. You are not prepared to give a reason for the hope. Look, let's look at what Paul says. Here's what he says, uh, or Peter says, and then Paul. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Put him as, as, the, as the ultimate. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give it the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared. This is why you are always on a mission. In, in, everywhere you go, whether the grocery store or you know, you're driving on the freeway, like myself maybe, and that's where you know, things start to go a little haywire. And, and like for me personally, I have a super handy Holy Spirit, my wife in the passenger seat, and she reminds me of that I'm still a Christian as I'm driving and I'm on a mission. And I'm like, I know, I know. I just need this person out of my mission. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> always be prepared. Wherever you are, this is why you're a missionary everywhere. Always be prepared to give an answer for, to everyone who, has, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Not heavy-handed, not, not judgmental, not do this or else. Here's what we're told. You have to be ready at any moment. Someone comes and you say, why do you have, why do you have this hope? Or why, why do you go to church? Or, you say you believe in Jesus. Why? And if you don't know, then your homework is to, is to figure that answer out. To be able to share within a few minutes, within a few lines. Because let me give you a couple options, okay? Uh, if option one is this. Well, I've always gone to church. We just kind of do it. It's just it's kind of our tradition. And so we go. And, you know, they got a cool kids program. Our kids like it. And, uh, you know, and, and um, the, the, I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to speak too highly of him, but the pastor is super funny. He's super wise. He's my favorite person in the world. And, you know, that's why I go to church. And that, that, that's your answer, which, you know, I'm, all right. How compelling is that? I mean, honestly. As a, is that what a missionary does? Is that what it's on mission? You're like, oh, we go because we always go. Or you say, you know what, honestly, I, it sounds weird, but I'm one of those crazy people who Jesus really changed his life. And like, I, you know, I, 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 you know, if you care to know, I can share, but I don't, I don't, I certainly don't mean to preach, but I go because Jesus really has changed my life. And, and I go to learn more. I go to worship him. I go to be with other people who, who, who would say the same thing. Like he's, and, and I, it's the most important thing in my life. That's why I go. Huh. That's, I can respect that. Even if they don't agree with it, they're like, can't argue with that. That makes sense. And then when you say like, hey, if you ever want to come. This is what I do with my neighbors. It's an open invitation. If you ever want to come, you're more than welcome. You know, we'll save you a seat. I can show you around. All right. You know, maybe one day, one day, we've, we've talked about maybe going to church. It's not combative. It's I have a reason for the hope that I have, and it isn't 
all right, let me give you these 14 points of theology. And I used to do that. I used to put, like throw in everything I could and be like, all right, I got six minutes and I'm going to just give you everything I can. And at the end, like, all right, do you want to be a Christian? Like, I proved to you. And they go, no. <laughs> like, whoa, what did I do wrong? Like, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> like, oh, oh. Be ready to share. You have to have a, a reason for the hope that you have to be prepared at any moment to share this. Look at what Paul says in Colossians. He says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, to those outside the church. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. It doesn't mean that you have an answer for everything, but rather you have a response for everyone, whatever they share. And, and can I give you, maybe, maybe one of the best responses you could ever give someone is this. That's a great question. I actually don't know. I actually don't know. That's, that'd be interesting. I need to look into that. And how about this? How about if you, know, if you really want a response, like a Christian response, let me, let me do some research. Let me look into that, and then maybe let's get coffee or we can meet up again, and, and if, if you care, I can right, kind of maybe share some of my perspective of you know, what I find. I've, I've done that. Like, I'm, I'm a pastor, right? I know I'm supposed to know everything, and I do. But, but there, are times, there are times when I'm like, I actually don't know. And, and you do a disservice when you make up an answer that you think sounds right. Well, I think that what seems to me, no, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Instead, I've done this. You know what? I've, I've actually never thought about it that way before. That's like, that's like really insightful. Like I've, you know, I've been around a while and I've never, like, you, clearly you're insightful. And they're like, oh, thank you very much. Let me, let's do this. How about, let me go, let me think about it. Let me go read some stuff. Let me, and then let's, if you're okay with it, we can meet up again and, and, and I can, I can kind of share like, oh, this, this seems to make sense. And, and in the meantime, like, who do you read? Like, what have you read or what have you, and they'll share. And it becomes this, this wonderful, like edifying, we're in, we're in this conversation together trying to figure this stuff out instead of like, oh, well, I'm the answer man and you just sit and listen to everything I have to say. Instead, instead, we're wise. We make the most of every opportunity where we do this with, with gentleness and respect. Here's the beauty of this. Ready? It doesn't require you to have a theology degree. It doesn't require you to have a stage or a pulpit or to say like, oh, well, my pastor, go, go ask him. People don't, can I be honest with you? And, and this, this is gonna hurt, this hurts me. People don't care what your pastor thinks. They care what you think. People don't care how I live. I mean, they, if I mess up, you know, if I'm in the news, that's a big deal. But but they're not looking at my life and being like, oh, wow, well, since your pastor did that, but they are looking at your life. They wanna know what you believe. They wanna know what's important to you, not, not to me. I'm just a guy that they can, if they come, they can hear, but the conversation happens with you and them. The relationship is with you and them. And, and so the, the point isn't like, well, we'll leave it to the professionals. The point is you are on a mission. You are on a mission. And there may be times where you don't have the answers and you get the joy of learning more about your faith and researching answers to questions you didn't know even existed and, and be able to share, to always be growing and learning, knowing that, man, I wanna always be ready to share the hope that I have and do so with gentleness and respect. And here's the third thing, the last thing. Not only do we, are we, ready to, you know, do we see people as God sees them? We're ready to share the reason we have this hope. The last thing is we trust God to work through our obedience. You trust God to work through your obedience. We plant, we water, and we let God make it grow. This is the key. You cannot convert anyone. All you can do is share the gospel, and you let God do the work. It, this, this is so freeing. That when, I, when I learned this for the first time, it was so freeing for me when my pastor talked to me about this. Um, here's, what, here's what 1 Corinthians says. Paul writes this. He says, I planted the seed. I share the gospel. Apollos watered it. He taught and encouraged you. But God has been making it grow. He does the work. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. You and I, you and I, we can't make faith grow in someone. All we can do is plant seeds or maybe water seeds, but God makes it grow. And this is the thing that helped me because I, 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 I was the guy, especially when I was new to faith and, you know, and, and, you know in, in college and in seminary, I'm like learning 
everything about faith, and it's all new. It's all the first time, and I'm so excited. I'm, like, telling everyone. And so, you know, and a conversation comes up about faith or church or, 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 you know, about God or whatever, and I'm, like, off to the races. I'm, like, I got, I got a 17-minute spiel that is going to blow your mind. Sit, sit down. <laughs> You're, like, uh... Well, I just asked, you know, uh, could, you, could you pass me some lettuce? No. I, well, <laughs> let us talk about Jesus. And, you know, like. <laughs> and, and he said, and so my pastor, he says this. All right, think of it like this. Um, think of sharing the gospel as a light bulb. And you, you're changing a light bulb, right? There's power to the light bulb, but the light bulb's dead. It went out. You got to put a new light bulb in. And when you put it in, what happens the first turn? I'm like, well, nothing. Does the light turn on? No. So do you stop? Well, of course not. You, you turn again. And then what happens? What, nothing. We, two turns of a light bulb is not, I, I, there's a joke in there somewhere. But I don't know how many times you have to turn it. But I know it's not two. And then a third time. And what happens? And he goes, what happens eventually? I go, well, eventually it turns on. He says, when you share the gospel with someone, even just a little bit, you're just doing a little bit of a turn. And, and you might not see the light turn on. In that conversation, they didn't come to Christ and like, I want to go to, I'll give my life to the Lord. I'm going to church. I'm saved. In that moment, you, you, not every conversation is not that. But it doesn't mean it didn't work. You can't get to a light bulb moment without first turning on all of the, the, the blank lights. And, and, you're, you're, and so you come in someone's life and you have a conversation. And it's just a little bit of a turn. They're a little bit closer. You, it, nothing changed. From the outside, nothing worked. It didn't look like anything happened. Next conversation, someone else comes and turns a little bit. And enough turns, eventually, the goal, the prayer, the hope is that they, they come to the realization, wow, I've been thinking about this now for years, maybe decades, and okay, I'm ready. And, and you see a light bulb moment come on, and maybe you're that last turn, and it's like an amazing experience, but, but don't act like you did the work. There have been people before you turning this, planting seeds, watering seeds, turning the light bulb, and, 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 and with the goal that hopefully you get to that point. You might be the first turn, and it's like, I feel like I did nothing. Man, that felt like it was, I just totally messed that up. No, no, you put a quarter turn on. Good job. Good job. And you don't have to, in one conversation, go like, I'm going to just, 17 minutes, I'm just going to keep turning until I twist my body until I get this light. That's not how it works. But here's what you don't want to do. Ready? You don't want to, now listen to me, you don't want to unscrew the light bulb, okay? How you live, the way you live, you might have... We, God forgive us when we do this, please, we might be actually unscrewing light bulbs for people. Or they might be closer, but because of you know, a negative experience or because they look at your life, because we aren't living our faith like faithfully and we are maybe being hypocritical in some things, like we're actually helping like, take the light bulb. We're undoing work of past people. I've seen that happen. I've been frustrated at people who have, I felt like, undid some of the work I did. Not as though it's like my work, but rather I'm like, oh, I'm investing in them, investing in them, and then they... They leave because of something someone else did. And I'm like, dang it. Another Christian totally like sabotaged their faith. Man. So you and I, instead, we realize it's, we plant, maybe we water, we turn the light bulb, and God eventually makes it. God eventually, we, Lord, turn the light on. We want to eventually turn the light on in their soul. So how do I do this? Let's go through four specific, like here's what this, okay, so now what? What do I do? All right. Here's some practical things. First, live authentically. Let your life reflect the gospel in word and deed. So this is, you, you live as you. Don't live as the person you think you should be. Don't, don't live as the like, well, you know, if I was a super Christian, I would do that. No, 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 listen. listen. You're not putting on a mask. You're not, you're, not, you're not a caricature of what a Christian should be and like speaking super spiritually to people. You're like just down to earth. When you pray, you pray you just honest, real words that you pray to the Lord, not... I've been in rooms where people, you know, they think I want to hear a certain thing. So, like, they start praying theologically and, like, hypostatic union. And, and you know, turn, and you're going, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you even know what that means? No, but I heard someone say it once. Like, all right, I don't think the Lord's impressed at your, you know, your, your unknown vocabulary. <laughs> you just be genuine. Uh, you live authentically. And number two, you build real relationships. You don't build relationships so that you can convert them. Don't, please don't do this. This used to be the thing. Hey, you're going to be, you know, be friends with everyone, and the goal is that you make them a Christian. Stop. You don't make them a Christian. You share the love of Jesus, what he's done in your life, and you pray and you hope, and, and you, you, like God moves in their life and does the same. But listen, 
You build relationships with your neighbors, not because you can convert them. You build relationships because we are relational people and it's worth it. It's worth it. Having the relationship, whether they come to Jesus or not, it's worth having a relationship. You build real relationships. You, you know the people in your life um, who, uh, who, who kind of establish like a fake rapport because you know they want something. They usually are telemarketers calling you. And your phone rings, you're like, hey. And they're like, oh, hi, is this Brandon? Yeah, it's him. Well, wonderful. How are you doing this fine day? What do you want? <laughs> right? Like, it doesn't take long for you to go, whatever you're selling, I'm not buying. Right? Someone knocks on your door. You're like, well, hey, we're just, we're just going by checking and seeing how people are doing. No, you're not. No, you're not. You got a bag in your hand. I don't want it. Right? You know when people are trying to sell you something, don't be that person. You have relationships with people because it's worth having relationships. That's why. You have real relationships with people. And then you do this. You pray for open doors. Lord, I'm praying for, pray for open doors for our neighbor, for so-and-so, for the Joneses, the Johnsons, the Smiths, the, whoever it is. All right, we're praying, God, that you know, as we do life together, that you, you provide open doors, opportunities. Maybe something comes up in their life or your life or they ask a question and you're like, you're ready. You're, as a missionary, you're ready. And they say, so why do you, you, know, why do you go to church? Oh, you want to come over for the game? Oh, I can't. We got church in the morning. You go to church, really? Yeah, and don't be ashamed. Yeah, we go to church. Why do you go to church? I'm, honestly, I'm not, not, not to get too crazy, but like God has really changed my life and he's real and, and you know, and you have your response and you're like, that's the open door. All right, don't mess it up. I go like, well, I know I'm trying to get my wife to let me off for football. You know, it's football season and, you know, but I, I, I got a job. I got to go preach. Like, I, I guess I got to show up today. <laughs> you pray for open doors and you don't let them go. Here's the last thing. You share your story. What does this mean to you? You should be able to share your story, your, your specific story within five minutes, easily. You could probably do it within two minutes. Two, two, a short version of two minutes and then a longer version of five minutes. Someone says, so why do you, what, what, what is, like, how did you come to this? Well, I mean, if you got a few minutes, I can share, like, I can show you the details. And I'm telling you, people will want to hear. I, I've done this so many times and people have asked, like, you know, why, how'd you get this? And, and, or, and, I'll, and I'll, say, I'll start by saying this. I'll start by saying, well, I don't, I don't want to bore you. I mean, I, I could share kind of like the history, um, you know, in a few minutes, but, you know, only if you want to hear it. I have never in my life, I've done hundreds of times, so hundreds of people, I've never had someone say, actually, no, I don't want to know. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've never had anyone do that. They've always said, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm, really, I'm really curious. We had dinner with some friends of ours, and, um, uh, and uh, they're both doctors, and he's a surgeon, and, um, and, uh, and, and uh, they had us over, our, you know, our kids are the same age and we're friends. And so, all right, we're going over and, you know, they got a super nice house and property and like llamas and stuff. You're like, okay, this is, this is different, you know. We have a turtle. Here's our turtle. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and we're having dinner and the first question they, that he asked, he goes, so I got a question for you. I'm like, all right, go for it. How did you get into this? Like, what is it? What happened to you? We were talking about, we were talking about the other day. Like, I wonder what got Brandon into this. They're thinking, about, I, I haven't even done anything. I haven't done any amount of gospel involvement at all in their life. And they're already like, what the heck? What could happen in your life? And if, if I didn't have an answer, if my answer was like, well, you know, you know it's got benefits and, you know, I, 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 they, pay, they pay me, so that's nice. I get a paycheck and, and uh, um, you know, I, I, it's cool. It's cool, you know? If that was my answer, wow, I just totally missed this opportunity. Instead, I'm ready to share. Hey, I, I can share, but, I, you know, you guys really want to know? Honestly, we re we're really curious. We're really interested. Awesome. They're asking me to share the gospel with them. They don't know that, but I'm ready. I'm a missionary. Listen, if you aren't ready at any moment, if, if you and I, if I met you in the hallway and you're like, hey, how did you come to faith? And you're like, no, oh, I shouldn't have come this direction. <laughs> <I should've." laughs> then, then your homework, your homework is to get ready. To get ready. Walk through it. Walk through it. If, you're, if you have people in your home, walk through it with your spouse, your kids, whatever. And, and like, all right. All right, I, I want to, I, I think this. Living on mission is an event. It is not an event. It's a lifestyle. And a person who is a disciple, a, a serious follower of Jesus, who's like, I'm in. I'm, I'm not just a Christian. I'm not a convert. We're not called to make converts. We're not even called to make Christians. We're called to make disciples. So as someone who's a disciple, you start off by saying, I'm on a mission. And I'm always on. I'm never off. I'm, I am a missionary whenever, wherever. Would you do this? Would you stand with me? And then we'll worship. So Lord, thank you that you have called us 
Not because we deserve it, not because we're somehow uh, wonderful on our own rights, not because we've earned anything, but because we are sheep without a shepherd and you, you became our shepherd because we are sinners in need of a savior. Help us to understand our role as missionaries to live a missional lifestyle. One that doesn't see missions as an event, but rather, but rather a mindset that we are always on mission. Help us to take seriously this calling to live it out in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we respond to